welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this first in a series of funder to funder conversations. This one focused on ch supporting children and families from prenatal to age three. I'm also incredibly excited to welcome you to GLR Week 2020. This session officially kicks off our virtual convening, which will ex extend throughout the week. And I'll share a little bit more about that in just one moment. But first, I'd like to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Torian, and I'm a consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, and I'm helping to manage their online learning series. Before we get started with today's conversation, I just wanted to go over a couple of really quick housekeeping details with you. First of all, I'd encourage you to introduce yourself. Let us know your name and organization using the chat box on your Zoom screen. Second, just wanted to share that all webinar attendees will be participating in listen-only mode during today's conversation, and that's to avoid any background noises or distractions during the presentations. But we do strongly encourage your active engagement throughout the conversation and so I'd invite you to share any thoughts or reflections or opportunities that you see for increased collaboration and alignment using the chat box on your Zoom screen. I'd also encourage you to share any questions that you'd like to pose of our panelists using the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. And please be sure to look for the Q&A box when you're asking questions. It really helps to make sure that they don't get buried underneath um, all of the comments in the chat box so that we can share them with the panelists when we move into the Q&A portion. Also, just a quick reminder that today's webinar is being recorded, and a link to that recording will be sent to all who registered for today's conversation. So keep an eye out for that email. It should come out um, early next week. Also, just a quick heads up that we will be posting a very brief survey poll after the presentations are through and during the Q&A portion of the webinar. And I'd encourage you to take just a couple of quick moments to share your thoughts and feedback with us through that. It really does help us with our commitment to continuous improvement. Now I'd like to share a little bit of information about GLR Week. Um, like countless other organizations across the country, this spring the campaign was forced to shift gears and radically change our plans for GLR Week 2020. <clears throat> but going virtual has actually ended up offering us a number of opportunities that we were unaware of at the time. First, it's offered us the opportunity to engage many who might not have been able to travel to Washington, D.C. to join us in person. But more importantly, it's offered us the opportunity to lift up the amazing work underway in states and communities across the country as, as a part of the GLR network. So on the screen, you can see that the campaign is sponsoring five virtual sessions this week, two today, including this funder to funder conversation, and then our GLR Learning Tuesdays uh, webinar, which is at the 3 p.m. Eastern time slot, with today's conversation engaging the governor and the state superintendent of education in the state of Mississippi, who will share, and they will share um, uh, updates about what leaders in that state are doing to sustain the impressive progress that they've made in literacy and math in recent years. After that, we will host one virtual convening each day for the remainder of the week. If you're interested in learning more about these sessions, um, the Campaign for Grade Level Readings website where you can find out more information as well as how to register for each of these conversations. Um, we're also noting, you can see the highlight there on the screen, oops, sorry, if we could go back, um, that we're uh, lifting up a session that's being uh, planned and hosted by one of our partners, McKinsey and Company. On Friday afternoon, it will be exploring the critical issue of ensuring equity in all responses to COVID-19. I've posted a registration link for that session as well in the chat box, so if you're interested in joining in for that, you can find that there. Now we can move to the next slide. Um, as I was saying earlier, we are incredibly excited about the response to the invitation that we made to state and community leads to organize events as a part of GLR Week. As you can see on the screen, um, we had about two dozen states and communities respond to that invitation and organize um, events this week. You can go to the Campaign for Grade Level Readings website to find an interactive map where you can learn more about the webinars, tutorials, um, report releases, video screenings, coffee chats, and more that states and communities are hosting this week. And I'd encourage you to uh, sign up for them and uh, participate and learn more with all of us throughout the week. And then uh, if we could go to the next slide, 
We are, of course, deeply appreciative to the sponsors who are providing their support for GLR Week. You can see our underwriting sponsors and sponsors for the week on the page. And then if you could go to the next slide, um, you can also see the enterprise investors that are investing in the campaign throughout the year. Um, none of this work would be possible without them, so we are deeply grateful for their support. Now I'd like to share a little bit of information about this new series that we're kicking off today, our funder to funder conversations. As you can see on the screen, we have uh, three conversations scheduled for the month of July, and we're planning to return to these conversations with some more uh, sessions later in the fall, so stay tuned for that. These sessions are in response to what the campaign heard back in 2018 when it did its listening tour traveling across the country and meeting with uh, local campaigns and state leads. They heard requests or, desi or a desire from state and local funders for more opportunities for shared learning, for collaboration, and for co-investment among local funders as well as in partnership with their more national counterparts. So that is what this series is going to seek to do. And we're confident that more intentional efforts to align our collective philanthropic resources will lead to stronger outcomes, bigger impacts, and higher returns on investment. So we are inc incredibly glad that you are joining us today for this first Funder to Funder conversation. And I hope that you'll tune back for more of these conversations throughout um, the remainder of the month. Next week, we'll be um, focusing on family and community math with the Heising Simons Foundation. And the following week, we'll look at the early learning educator workforce with the Early Educator Collaborative. But now for today's conversation. The prenatal to uh, age three time period lays the foundation for so much in terms of future learning and well-being. High quality early learning, systems of care, and supports for young children and their families are vital parts of efforts to ensure early school success for children in low-income families. The JB and MK Pritzker Family Foundation is a national leader in supporting children and families in these critical early years. The Pritzker Children's Initiative has been a champion of quality early learning for nearly two decades. And so it is my great honor to introduce our presenter for today, Janet Fresher, the president of the J.B. and M.K. Pritzker Family Foundation. As president of the foundation, Janet uh, develops strategy and drives the foundation's implementation to create results, supporting the foundation's priority areas of early childhood development, health care, and civil rights. And these represent the three cornerstones of the foundation. She has a distinguished background as a leader in a number of large nonprofits and funder entities, having served as the CEO of the Special Olympics and of United Way of Metropolitan Chicago. And she has also served as the president of the National Safety Council and COO of the Aspen Institute. So welcome, Janet. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, delighted to be here. So, Janet, as I just mentioned in your intro, uh, through the Pritzker Children's Initiative, the Pritzker Family Foundation has been a champion of quality early learning for nearly 20 years. Can you share a little bit with us about the foundation's history and work and what led you to focus on this critical time period in a child's life? Absolutely, Sarah. So I just want to say thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about um, the areas that we're engaged in, particularly prenatal to age three. Um, and obviously, it's really absolutely critical for children and getting children ready to learn. So the um, Pritzker Children's Initiative is a project of the JB and MK Pritzker Family Foundation. As you can imagine, um, it was founded by JB and MK, as you said, a couple decades ago. JB is now the governor of Illinois. So JB and MK are out of the decision making and off of the board of the foundation itself. Um, we focus in a variety of areas, uh, human and civil rights, health, um, but the initiative that we're talking about today, the Children's Initiative, is a national focus, and JB began the focus on children, and in particular, young children, about 20 years ago. So why prenatal to age three? It's a pretty simple answer, and that is science. Um, JB's focus was really poverty alleviation, and back a couple decades ago when he started to do the research on how you could make the biggest impact in terms of reducing poverty, 
he came across the research that the Harvard Center for the Developing Child and others did about the brain science and the fact that in the early years, um, it was, as you said earlier, what laid the foundation for all future development in terms of learning. It was the foundation for brain development. I will say that um, about a month ago, the Harvard Center for the Developing Child came out with another working paper. You'll see it on their website. But basically what it says is it's not just the foundation for learning, but those first years of life are actually the foundation for all future learning behavior and health. So I'm going to um, attempt to do a layman's description of why that is um, without making my friends at the Harvard Center for the Developing Child cringe. Um, and this is the first time I've talked about it because it just came out uh, last month. There is a much more accurate description on the Harvard Center for the Developing Child website, but I'm gonna give you the layman's story. And if I don't get it exactly right, I hope you'll forgive me. But essentially, um, we don't argue about nature versus nurture anymore. What we know is that as a child develops, the environment that they develop in, the way that the environment interacts with them, actually impacts the way that their body and their brain develops. And what we've learned in this most recent research is it's actually even earlier than birth to three. It's actually prenatal to age three. That, to be specific, prenatal to age two is a period of biggest development. And what happens is all the parts of the body interact with each other. They don't develop separately. And if children are subject to extreme levels of stress in those early years of life, it affects the way all these different parts of the body develop. So stress in and of itself, so um, stress is created for back in the old caveman days when you saw a dinosaur and you needed your body to do all sorts of stuff to be able to flee. In the world that we live in, if you have constant levels of stress that don't stop, all those things that the body does stay on high alert and it creates issues in terms of the way the body develops. So high levels of persistent stress can overlie, overload the body's biological systems and stay on permanent high alert. And that leads to long-term risk of things like cardiovascular disease, obesity, type two diabetes. What we also know is a little bit more now about the brain development. And what we know is that in particular, it impacts three areas of brain development in the early years. It impacts emotion regulation. It impacts memory systems, which are really important for the early year development. And it also impacts executive functioning systems like impulse control and ability to focus attention and higher level cognitive skills development. So those are the areas of the brain in particular that are impacting the, in those first years. And it actually prevents the connection of the neurons of the brain to, to connect in those areas. And the brain is built from the bottom and layered on up. The other thing it does is it creates this inefficient um, system for um, your immune system and creates a persistent level of inflammation. And what that leads to is um, a much greater propensity for inflammation-related diseases later in life. And those are diseases like depression, diabetes, arthritis, auto, autoimmune disorders, and many types of cancer. And then to just pile on and make it even worse, the combination of stress and um, inflammation has really severe impacts on your cardiometabolic system, which is really important for things like diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So I've way, way, way oversimplified what is obviously um, a very complex system. But the major point or the major takeaway is just what you said earlier, Sarah, but now expanded. And that is that in particular, the age of prenatal to age three are what lay the, the foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health, not just short-term health, but long-term health, particularly those parts those types of health issues that are very expensive and that are chronic. Wow. So, so that's our summary. <laughs> that's a wonderful layman's terms overview, and that's, that's the kind of overview that I need. Powerful science behind this work, including science we've known for a long time, as well as this new science that's just coming out and emerging, both in terms of the early brain development that we've known, but now knowing you know, how many other parts of a child's body and development and their future health that these early years impact. 
So how are you responding to that science? Can you tell us about uh, the Pritzker's Children Initiative in terms of um, what you're trying to achieve and your theory of change for that work? Sure. So let me tell you a little about what our goal is and what our strategy is. So um, I would love to be able to, our main focus is that children reach school prepared to learn. And as you know, our focus is prenatal to age three. Um, I would love to be able to say X percent of children are on track for kindergarten readiness at age three, but we don't have an ability yet to measure that at a population level, although that is one thing we're working on. Um, so we set a goal that was as close as we could get, but not a great one, um, which is that in the next year, between now and 2023, a million more low-income children and their families will have access to high quality services. So we believe in setting um, what we call BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. So the only way that we're gonna get to that is to be catalytic in the way that we invest. So our strategy is what we call a tipping point strategy and, or a movement building strategy. And so what that means for us is that we really look um, for the innovators and the early adopters and then we focus on providing them as much support as we possibly can in a variety of ways so that they have a much better chance to win, to do the things that they're trying to do. We spend a lot of time on momentum building investments, both to help them with their work, but also so that other states and communities can see the work they're doing and follow the example that they set. And then we strive to really measure so that they and we and others can see whether we're actually making progress. So that's what we call our tipping point strategy. I'll show you our logic model and just touch on it briefly. Um, so this is our children's initiative logic model. I'm actually, uh, you know, to spare everyone, I'm not gonna read you every word, but I will hit the highlights. And so what we've done is we have a state strategy that focuses on those early adopter states that we know wanna focus on prenatal to age three and have what um, we and others think are the conditions in place to really make an impact. We've also invested in a variety of communities. We started with 29, um, working with a, a variety of partners, and we've now just made additional investments into 10 communities that we think are really those early adopters that are gonna set the bar and prove it out and show folks um, what it takes to really focus on infants and toddlers. As I said, we've got this momentum building strategy, a way to be able to explain why you focus on prenatal to three, but also as a way to encourage others to focus on prenatal to three. Um, we spend a lot of resources on building capacity, helping those early adopters build their capacity. And then because that creates demand for high quality services and programs, we spend a lot of time sourcing those programs that show some evidence of working, but also helping them scale to meet the demand created by those states and communities. And then we focus on measurement, both at a population level, measure at, uh, level, but also on a programmatic level to be able to understand which programs are working and for whom they are working. So that's at a very high level. I'm gonna do just a little bit later down, but I'm not gonna go way deep into the words, would to spare everybody, but always happy to do that. So let me talk a little bit about um, the Children's Initiative state strategy. Um, what we did is um, a few years ago, three years ago, we, um, we went out to states, we talked to lots of folks to try to understand which states were really focused on prenatal age three and which had support at a state level from a legislative point of view, had a strong advocacy community, had the infrastructure and the wind to make it happen. Um, and then about two years ago, um, we issued a request for proposals to any state that wanted to focus on prenatal to age three and was willing to say they were active, they were willing to actively work to really try to move the needle in a significant way. We were shocked to have 42 out of the 45 states apply. So there are 42 additional states in addition to our six that submitted an application saying, we really wanna focus on prenatal to age three. Um, obviously that made us for some hard choices, uh, but what we did is we picked 14 additional states and we gave planning grants to those states uh, to create a plan over the next nine months and to build coalitions to craft a plan to increase the number of services to infants and toddlers over the next three years um, 
by 25% of their low-income children population, and within five years by 50%. So those are really big goals. Over the course of those nine months, and you'll see the states in here that we're focused on, um, they built very large coalitions from coalitions of 50 organizations to some as large as three and 400. Local foundations are part of every single one of those foundations. And I saw a number of United Ways sign on. Lots and lots of United Ways are parts of those coalitions. The coalitions focus both on early learning as well as health. It's for us, those early years are about more than learning, but they're about learning, health, and supporting families and supporting providers and caregivers. Um, the strategies all link in. There's CCDBG funds, the preschool development funds, their Title V funds, their um, McV funds. They really are meant to really coordinate the resources within the state. They all have links to their communities, and those coalitions really built strategies that they thought would enable them to make significant progress on additional services, high quality services for infants and toddlers. Um, we had thought um, that in those nine months, lots of states would um, drop out and that we wouldn't actually see plans because the goals were so big. But every single state that got a planning grant um, created really, really, really strong plans. Now they had the help from Build and a lot of other folks, but they created plans that were really aggressive, really believable. They were really layered and concrete. And so we ended up, we're just in the midst of our last couple of grants right now, providing three-year implementation grants to every single one of those states. So we will have um, three-year commitments to all 20 states to help them um, and support them implementing uh, their strategies. Now, we're not the only funder um, in these, um, these coalitions and these grants. Um, they all have involvement by design um, from local foundations um, and from their governments. Um, so these plans are way bigger than our resources, but we provide foundational resources to help in the coordination of those plans coming together and their execution. Um, and I won't even tell you about the community strategy just by way of time, but I'm happy to um, in answering questions. So that's the state piece of the strategy. All of our other strategies revolve around those. So let me just talk for a moment about building capacity. Um, we have supported the BUILD initiative. Every state has a um, partner, a BUILD, and an individual at BUILD who is meant to support them. Their job is to help figure out um, with the states what it is they need to be successful and then to get it for them. So if they want to focus on how to be able to explain why you invest in prenatal age three, um, we've contracted with GMMB to provide communication support. If they need to understand how to access Medicaid, uh, Georgetown is available to help them with that. If they need to understand and to think about what does high quality child care look like, um, we've got a grant to the to CAT to be able to provide that support. Um, if they want to focus on, um, on fam friend, family, neighbor care, um, I saw Natalie Renew from Homegrown um, on uh, log on, but Erickson Institute has also been doing work in that area. So our focus is really to say, what is it that these um, states need to be successful? And then how do we partner with a variety of different organizations to be able to, pri to provide that support to the state coalition. Now, coupled with that, um, as I mentioned earlier, is a need um, to, to create innovation and to create scaling opportunities, because as we saw very quickly, um, and, um, Jerry, thanks. <laughs> what we saw very quickly as the state built their plans is many of them wanted to scale Family Connect across the state, or they wanted to scale uh, help me grow, or they wanted to create centering health, centering pregnancy, um, or nursery only partnerships. So what we then had to do is to partner with a number of organizations to create scaling plans. Help me grow didn't have a scaling plan. Family Connects didn't have a scaling plan. So we really partnered with a lot of these national organizations to create scaling plans, and then to help support the scale up of those plans. Um, and some of these are actually working together in ways that they can scale together. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, another critical part is creating momentum. So how do we create noise and buzz 
um, about prenatal age three to help these states with their work, but also to encourage other states and communities to follow the examples that they're setting. Um, and so we've partnered with organizations and there are actually 30 movement building partners that we've partnered with. I've just given you a few here from Moms Rising to the Chamber Execs to NPSL, NGA, Council for Stronger America, Education Writers Association. There are a variety of organizations, all of which are doing a few things. Um, they are making the case within their constituents for a focus on prenatal to age three. Um, they're identifying champions um, within legislators or um, state health officials to um, be able to talk about the importance of prenatal age three. We actually had a gathering of all of our movement building partners um, in December, and they said to us, you know, we'd like to work together more. We all work independently and making the case, but we'd really like to find a way to, you know, put our collective voices together and, um, and have a more cohesive strategy amongst us to build momentum. And so we're actually working to do that right now um, with some partners. So at a very high level, I hope I didn't overdo it, but I, that's essentially what our theory of change is and how we focus on hopefully being catalytic in terms of our investments. Amazing. So much work that you're doing and with so many partners and in so many places across, across the country. You mentioned a little bit about how Pritzker has been working with some state and local foundations as a part of its state strategy and that you're investing to build the capacity of states and communities to implement these prenatal to age three initiatives. Where do you see the potential for maybe expanding those types of partnerships? or deepening partnerships with state and local funders? Yeah, it's, I would say the answer is everywhere. So the opportunities to partner um, for us um, are, we are in every single one of um, the pieces that I just talked about, but I'll pull out just a few um, to talk about for a moment. Um, Jerry, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. There we go. Um, so I mentioned the work that BUILD is doing. Part of what they are tasked with doing is to actually take those tools that are being created by the states and communities and make them available to anyone who's got an interest in prenatal to three. So to other states, foundations, and communities, um, they have put that those resources um, in a website by the, Na by the National Collaborative for Infants and Toddlers, it's the NCIT. Um, they also, hopefully in a few months, will be available with a help desk for anyone that's got an interest in prenatal to H3. They'll be able to call BUILD and get, you know, linked to different resources and different examples of what other states and communities are doing. Um, these, um, this work that's done in the states is really led by local foundations. We just help access some of the national resources rather than every single community and state trying to access those resources together. And we provide, obviously, learning collaboratives so that states and communities can learn from each other. But that work is all, as you can tell by the plans being created at the state level and community level, they are driven at the state and community level. We just help coordinate some of the resources and the learnings at a national level so they can learn from each other. But that's all driven through BUILD and the, um, the Capacity Building Hub at NCIT. The other thing we heard very clearly from um, local partners, um, in particular legislators, is that they really wanted to understand, if they wanted to focus on prenatal to age three, what were the policies that they needed to pass? What were the practices they needed to put in place? And when we studied momentum building, um, looked at pre-K, what really drove a lot of the pre-K movement was the NEAR report. So we were looking for a central place for states to be able to see what each other's doing, but also a central place to be able to say, here's what all the research says that's out there on prenatal age three. This is what the research tells us have been the most impactful policies. And then this is the types of outcomes that those states are seeing at a population level as a result of those programs and those policies. So a way to connect research to policy, to programs, to outcomes, and also a source for local found foundations, um, local legislators to be able to say, I'm thinking about this versus this, you know, what is the best policy? Um, and what are the differences between a policy like this or a policy like that and whether states are doing this? And so we were a lead funder to create this um, prenatal three impact center. It's headquartered at the University of Texas. 
Um, they will actually be launching their first report um, this fall, actually in another couple months. That'll literally say, here's what, here are the best policies or the practice, the policies that are best supported today by research. And these are some of the programs and strategies that are best supported by research. And they will create, um, in doing that, a way to be able to call or look online to be able to see what research says about effective policies and practices. So they're really meant to be an exchange. And then the last one I wanted to highlight for you, because it really is such an active um, collaborative of national and local funders, is an organization called Homegrown. I saw Natalie Renew and Steph from Gary Community Long On and our friends at Bainham. Um, but there are, we were in Heinz as a, an original um, founder of Homegrown. There were 10 foundations, national and local, that had a strong interest in informal child care. And that's because the majority of infants and toddlers that are low income are not in centers, but they're in, in homes. They're in um, homes of grandmothers or the person down the street or neighbors. And um, we all knew that we wanted to better support quality in home care, um, but there was so little known about it that we felt that individually it was like putting a pebble in the ocean. So collectively, the 10 of us came together and crafted a strategy that we could, could collectively focus on to support home-based child care. And then we hired a couple of staff led by Natalie Renew to lead that effort. And that has gone live <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. Um, when COVID hit, um, Homegrown created a fund to match funds by local foundations to provide support to home-based providers and a variety of tools uh, for local foundations and for um, home-based providers. Um, so there is a ton of information out there and a way um, for additional local foundations and national foundations to be able to partner with all of us. Um, so we've also put the contact information there um, for Natalie and for the homegrown effort. Great, thank you. So many, so much work, so many balls in the, the air and so many different kind of approaches that you're taking to strengthening and supporting supports for children and families during these critical first three years. Just wanted to point out um, that we, speaking of Homegrown and Natalie Renew, we did um, feature the work of Homegrown in a uh, previous GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar in May. And so I'll share the link to that either in the chat box or in our follow-up email for folks that'd like to kind of learn a little bit more about the work that they're doing and the funds that they've created in response to COVID-19. But so thank you for that wonderful overview, Janet. Um, and now I'd like to welcome in uh, into the conversation three state and local funders. Uh, these leaders have also been advancing efforts to support young children in their families inside of their geographies and of focus. I'll start with Elizabeth Buck. Elizabeth became president of the United Way of Central Iowa in 2017 after serving as chief community impact officer since 2011. Prior to joining United Way, she served as Governors Vilsack and Culver's deputy chief of staff from 1999 to 2007 until her appointment as Governor Culver's director of Iowa workforce development in 2007. Next, we have Marika Cox Mitchell. Marika serves as the Director of Early Learning at the Bainham Family Foundation. Before joining the foundation, Marika worked for the National Association for the Education of Young Children, or NACI, where she most recently served as Deputy Executive Director of Early Learning Systems. In this role, she led a portfolio encompassing public policy and advocacy, accreditations of early learning programs, higher education accreditation, and the Power to Profession initiative. And then finally, we have Ann Kubish. Ann joined the Ford Family Foundation in 2013 as its second president. She came to the foundation after 19 years at the Aspen Institute in New York. Uh, she founded and served as director of the Aspen Roundtable on Community Change, a national resource center that advises policymakers funders and practitioners on strategies for improving outcomes for low-income children, families, and communities. So welcome, Elizabeth, Marika, and Anne. Thank you so much for joining us for today's conversation. Uh, before we hear your reflections on what you've just heard from Janet Fresher about the work that Pritzker is doing, um, could each of you provide a little bit of background um, 
about your respective foundations in terms of you know where you're working and what you're doing in the zero to three space. And I thought maybe we could follow the same order of introductions. So starting with you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Sarah, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm the president of the United Way of Central Iowa, and I'm excited to see how many United Ways are um, here on this webinar today, and more excited because so many United Ways across the country are engaged in this work. And um, our United Way is based in Des Moines, and we have a footprint that is both urban and rural. And our big goal is, in education is that 95% of our youth um, 93.4%, so we've seen a 10% gain in the last uh, 10 years. Um, so the next slide really highlights the work that we are doing um, in the zero to three space. And um, our work um, really goes back um, 20 years here at United Way of Central Iowa. Um, we commissioned a study um, with the Child and Family Policy Center uh, back in 2000, and it really highlighted um, the importance of early childhood, and of course, we've looked at the um, studies um, that were mentioned earlier by Janet. But um, our premise um, in our in our sort of our strategies on early childhood was that um, we wanted to ensure that um, children in Central Iowa were able to attend um, kindergarten ready to learn, and so we work with. Um, a variety of different um, areas, but we have 16 child care centers that we work with that are um, focused on kindergarten readiness. These um, 16 child care centers um, have a high, a high per, uh, percentage population of um, low income children. So most of the children in those centers are on child care assistance. And we focus our work on making sure um, that they have healthy developmental screening, um, that there is curriculum um, based uh, in those child care centers, but we also focus efforts around professionalizing and developing strong teachers. Um, so ensuring that wages are um, there and um, just uh, really making sure that we know, we know that how important it is that the um, teachers are high quality and prepared um, for these in these centers. We also have a focus on home visit programs, um, uh, getting to children um, before birth, and then um, working with the family unit um, uh, very early on um, to make sure um, that they have all the necessary um, tools for success. We also have a program around home providers too. So lots of work um, going on to ensure that kids in Central Iowa are prepared for kindergarten. So that's a quick overview of a lot of work that we're doing um, here in Central Iowa. That's great. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. And I, I, we, I, there were some moments when it was hard to hear you. So maybe when the next time you come on, if you can stay closer to your phone or um, log in. Sorry about that. But I want to make no, sure everybody. Thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Marika, can you share the work that uh, the Bainham Fam Family Foundation is doing, both broad scale and um, in the zero to three space? Sure. Um, again, thanks for this opportunity to talk about our work as well as to learn from others. And so the Bainham Family Foundation, we're based in Bethesda, Maryland, and we focus on improving the quality and availability of resources for children living in poverty. We were established in 1968. We're about 52 years old. Um, and we have um, four primary areas um, of focus. Early learning is one of the four, but we also focus on food security, school, mental health, as well as faith-based education. Geographically, the bulk of our work is in Washington, DC, but we do have relationships and we are committed to work in other communities, both domestically and internationally. As far as early learning, um, while we focus on the early learning system as a whole, we focus specifically on birth to three or prenatal to three. Uh, we have our work organized like many other foundations in the research policy practice buckets. Um, when it comes to practice or direct service work, we focus on improving the quality and accessibility of early learning programs. And that includes center-based programs as well as home-based programs. We provide mental health and health resources, again, prenatal through 
age three. We also provide resources um, to support families, ensuring that um, they are leaders in their communities um, and have the supports they need to be um, effective. Our policy and advocacy work focuses both on improving implementation of existing services in areas like um, mental health, food security, just look at the child, uh, universal child care, for example, um, as well as pushing the system and being more innovative and ensuring that we have a more sustainable, robust, and um, equitable system. So looking both at existing systems as well as looking at the North Star and pushing for more sustainable, robust, equitable systems. And certainly we use research to um, inform and strengthening the services and systems. Thank you. Now turning to you, Anne, and your beautiful backdrop of Oregon. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, it's nice to see everyone. Thank you for inviting us. Thanks, Janet, for sharing your work. And I want to thank Ralph Smith for his leadership around these issues for many years. So I'm representing the Ford Family Foundation. We're based in Oregon and also Northern California. We are a rural oriented foundation. We're one of the few foundations that works exclusively in rural areas. Our mission is successful citizens in vital rural communities, which really means we invest in people. We use the word citizen to, in the civic way, not in the legalistic way, but we invest in people and we invest in place. Uh, we've been around since the late 1990s and our largest grant making area focuses on kids. Uh, we, the zero to three, which I'll talk about later, but also we have work at, in the K-12 arena on school reform and out of school time youth development programs. We have a visual arts program in honor of one of our founders. Um, that's a small part of what we do. But I wanna also focus on the, the, the community part of the work that we do. We have a, a very strong emphasis on investing in community building. We have a department called community building, which is about helping communities come together, think about a vision for their future, develop a plan and implement that plan around whatever their, their priorities are in rural areas. And those are very largely focused often on kids, not surprisingly, and also on the economy, making sure that rural communities are um, vital and thriving places for kids and families to, to live. Uh, the next slide talks about the, our work in the zero to three arena. It is one of our largest grant making areas. Uh, we focus on kids being healthy, kids uh, perinatally uh, and as they're in the early years, and very much of a focus on kids being free from abuse as well, not just healthy and well, but also free from abuse. We have a strong program around parenting education, thinking about parents as their kids' first teachers and making sure that kids grow up in nurturing and supportive environments. We have a focus on high quality early learning, making sure that we have um, uh, a variety of models for, for high quality early learning settings that can work throughout rural Oregon and, and making sure that the models are tailored to the rural circumstances. And that's where the fourth, mo the fourth block there about connected and supportive communities, making sure that they are healthy places for kids to grow up. So that's the summary of our work. And as I say, it's, mo it's in rural Oregon and in Northern California. Great, thank you so much. Um, great, uh, like wonderful diversity of um, communities and areas that you're working in, but with similarities in terms of the support that you're giving to children and families in these early critical years. So now I know you, all three of you were listening in as Janet Fresher was presenting and sharing the, um, the work that the Pritzker Children's in Initiative is doing. So can you now share your reflections with me uh, in terms of what you heard? Uh, what are the implications for the work of the Pritzker Children's Initiative for state and local funders like yourselves? And, and how does that initiative align with the work that you're doing to support families with young children? And I thought maybe we could flip flop the order now and start with you and this time and then come to you, Marika, next. Sure, great. Thank you, Sarah. 
Yeah, I, it was really great listening to Janet's, uh, Janet's slides and particularly the rationale for the work because I think we are also guided by the science and fortunately the science is becoming increasingly clear about what kinds of supports kids need on the, on the positive side and also the impact of stress and stressors on kids outcomes. And so I really appreciated you grounding what you were saying in the science, Janet, because we certainly do as well. With a, with, for early childhood with a goal of kids entering kindergarten ready to learn, which I think all of us have actually mentioned in our comments today. So I want to focus on a couple of the things that I think related to some of the, the kinds of initiatives that, that Janet was talking about. The first has to do with parenting and, and, and parents as the kids first, teachers as their nurturers and supporters. We in rural Oregon uh, have, we've been investing in a universal parenting education program for almost 20 years. And we have some local foundation partners where the goal was to build a parenting education hub in each one of our 36 counties. We have now done that after, after 20 years of investment. Uh, we've trained more than 50,000 parents in, in home and parenting education. We have a high quality evaluation done by Oregon State University, our land grant. Uh, college and we have really a thriving network now of parenting education. Similarly, as parents, as, as, as sort of nurturers, we are, uh, we, have, we are working a lot on home visiting and particularly trying to make home visiting the models, trying to, to apply the models in rural areas because there's lots of challenges to the home visiting model when you're talking about rural areas where the distances are really far apart, where, where isolation and disconnect is really a, a big problem. So taking the model of, of home visiting and trying to adapt it to rural areas is one big, so, and that and parenting education, I think really align with some of the work that Janet was talking about. The second thing I wanna talk about is high quality early learning settings. We, we have um, increasingly try, been looking at helping communities to get P3 alignment, prenatal to third grade alignment, and have been working with some key partners in Oregon on some, some um, exemplary models. We have a partnership with the Children's Institute in Oregon, where we have an urban site and a rural site of trying to, to put together a community-based support system for, for getting kids on that aligned on that P3 uh, continuum. And in the case of our rural uh, site, which we have been funding for several years in Yonkala in, in rural Oregon, we have, we've seen a complete transformation in community culture around supporting kids and kids development, including now a pre-K year and an early Head Start year and so on. It's been really exciting and particularly exciting in a, in a community that has had seen 30 years of job loss due to the transformation of the timber industry, generational poverty, and lots of stressors on parents and kids. And then the third thing I um, just want to circle back to is again this idea of stressors. We, I, I think in Oregon, we're seeing, we have seen increasing attention to the understanding of the science that Janet was talking about, about adverse childhood experiences. We, our foundation has had a long standing support for child abuse prevention and intervention but are doing much more now around early screening, trying to develop early rural models for early childhood mental health consultation, creating the workforce around infant mental health, including supporting graduate coursework and endorsements and building up the, the, the workforce system. So those are some examples of some of the things that we're doing that I think aligns really well with what Janet is doing. And again, our emphasis is on trying to, to apply it in rural communities. Um, interesting. Before we uh, transition to Marika, I just want to lift up, you were talking about Yonkala Valley, and I wanted to share for folks who are interested in learning more about the work there, we will be doing, featuring them in a webinar, the GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar on August 11th, looking at their efforts to promote regular student attendance in a rural community, particular strategies there. So just wanted to share that since you mentioned that. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Marika, I'd love to hear what you'd have to share in terms of the alignment between your work and uh, what Janet Pressure shared. Absolutely, definitely saw a lot of alignment and um, I focus a lot on the logic model um, slide. Um, and I think what Janet's presentation highlighted was the importance of using signs to drive our investments and partnerships. 
And while the universal focus on young children and families is critical, it shows that we also need to have a targeted focus on prenatal to three where the gaps and opportunities are greatest. Um, I think this is complicated and complex work. It's a multi-dimensional issue and um, it requires a multi-dimensional strategy. I, I think that's important to sort of connect the two, which is why the concurrent focus on research policy and practice um, is definitely aligned to what we do in DC. Um, and making sure, I think sometimes it just it sounds cliche to say research policy practice will nod our heads, but looking at the investments to see do we do equitably and sometimes equally invest in research policy and practice um, is something we need to pay more attention to. And looking at who's at the table, um, making sure that we're bringing in um, all of those organizations that have existing relationships with the communities we're serving. Uh, the combination of having both national organizations as well as local organizations um, as part of the work was really important and mirrors what we're doing locally, as well as prioritizing families and children that have been um, systemically marginalized in the existing system. So I think overall, we definitely saw a lot of um, commonalities between the Pritzker Children's Initiative and what we're doing and learning in um, DC with our early learning work. Yes, this is a multi-dimensional and complex issue that requires a complex logic model like the one that um, Janet shared um, and requires us to focus um, on research policy and practice and not just give it lip service. Can I also just add, Sarah, um, Bainham is our lead um, foundation in um, DC. I'm not sure I've been to any meeting with any of our DC work where there hasn't been, you know, Bainham leading a huge bit of the of the work. They did just enormous, really, really important work on the uh, child care side. And then when we entered the partnership from our side with them, they, they expanded even more into the health side. So it's been really interesting to watch all the many, many ways that they play in DC. And it's been a really fun partnership for us from linking the national and the local. So that's getting to the complex and complicated, the many roles that they're playing in the work in DC. Um, and loved your reference to the, the theory of change slide, Marika, really showing how much work is involved. I mean, there was a lot of fine print in that slide because there's so many layers to this work, both in what you're doing at Bainham and the work that Christopher is doing. So Elizabeth, love to come back to you now and hear where you see the alignment between um, what the Pritzker Children's Initiative is doing and the work that you're doing in Iowa. Yeah, and thank you, Janet, so much for sharing um, your work. And I think um, it's fair to say that our work um, also is evidence-based and um, it's, that's been exciting to see that growth all across our sector. But um, a couple of things that really struck home with me when you were presenting, Janet, one of them was how important that state level work is. And we have felt that tension locally because you know we're all trying to do great things for our kids and we need system changes and we need it to happen at um, a bigger level than the local level. So um, you know, here in Iowa, we have um, an early childhood coalition and um, we have come together, but um, we've only found success when we really um, talked about early childhood in terms of a workforce issue. And it's kind of sad to say that, but um, that's where we've seen the most gain is when we can um, really make the case that this is the workforce of the future um, here in Iowa. So I'm really excited to see those partnerships statewide because I think that's that system change is gonna be so necessary in our country. Um, I also was excited to see the um, highlight that you had about home providers. Um, here in Iowa, our biggest growth in our population is with new Iowans. And immigrants and refugees are so much more comfortable in um, a home setting. And we've been able to um, set up some really exciting programs um, to train and support our home providers um, in a culturally competent way that really um, make sure that those kids are ready to learn in kindergarten. So um, I'm excited to learn more about the homegrown work um, that's been going on because I think this is a, a piece of the puzzle that sometimes 
we forget because it is so grassroots and it's so hard and it's um, relationship based. So um, I'm excited to learn more about that homegrown work and what that's doing. And just um, here in Iowa also, we've had a focus on adverse childhood experiences and I'm anxious to just learn more about the new report coming out of Harvard because um, trauma is such a big impact on um, kids and, and adults. So um, I think there's a lot of alignment um, with what you what you shared this morning, um, Janet. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for that. So now um, I'm interested in hearing from each of you again about where you see opportunities for more co-investment and collaboration. And also, and possibly more importantly, where do you see barriers to um, that co-investment and collaboration? And how might we work to address those barriers? Um, and for this one, I thought we could start with you, Marika. So I mean, I think it's important for us to all model and mirror the collaboration we seek. Um, I would imagine that in every agreement we have with our partners, um, a grantee's collaboration is certainly highlighted. Um, and it's important for us to, again, just, just model that. I think it's important to recognize that we're all navigating the same systems. We definitely have geographic dif um, differences, but we're pretty much all navigating the same systems and asking the system to be responsive to families um, in similar ways. Um, and this is also not a new conversation. I think just recognizing that there are many organizations been in the space for decades. Um, important to know we're not starting with a blank slate. And so it is definitely important for us to build and scale together. I think, um, again, the work that Janet uh, described with the Pritzker Children's Initiative just focuses on scaling up and innovation. I think that's really important for us to work together and not to reinvent, try to reinvent the wheel. Um, I think um, policy and momentum building require both national and local advocates. And we need to help bridge the gap between local and national advocates. I think on some issues in at certain times, we often see that local advocates are actually more effective in pushing some um, initiatives and building the momentum and national advocates perhaps should follow the local advocates depending on the context and vice versa. There are some contexts and some policy windows where we see that national advocates um, are just more poised and better able to, to navigate and gain momentum. So I think just helping to bridge the gap between local and national advocates and ensuring that they're both supported and valued for the unique role they play um, is an interesting opportunity for co-investment and collaboration. As well as maximizing the resources we're providing directly to service providers in the health, mental health, um, and early learning sectors. Um, early learning, early childhood um, is a very um, fragmented system. And I think um, we, there's an opportunity for us to collaborate and push back a little bit and challenge the fragmentation in the system um, and create um, a more coherent system so that we can maximize the resources that are going directly to the um, service providers. I think um, it's important for us to not create more <laughs> layers, more fragmentation. Um, that takes away the investments um, that could be going directly to our um, providers in all of these various sectors. Um, and some of the challenges of doing that, of course, some of the barriers will be just our own internal processes, um, putting the mirror up to ourselves a little bit. Um, we've been doing that a lot at our foundation, um, looking at how we um, bring partners into our portfolio, the reporting requirements, the due diligence processes, I think all of those internal processes um, can sometimes create administrative burden that um, can get in the way of us being um, better collaborators. And it, I think also just creating the space for collaboration. Um, we've seen that collaboration, just it just takes time um, just to learn each other, um, have those intentional conversations and grow together and build trust because it's so essential for collaboration. So I think just creating space for collaboration is important. 
and challenging, being willing to challenge all of our mental models around the areas in which we, we support. Thank you. Beautiful comments and reflections on that. Um, very powerful. Elizabeth, what would you add to that in terms of um, opportunities for co-investment and collaboration and barriers that stand in the way to that? I think she did a wonderful job highlighting a lot of um, the areas, but I think um, what's exciting about having um, national and local partnerships is you really get to learn from each other. I mean, Janet had so many great um, research-based uh, models and best practices that we might not know at the local level. So um, that's where I think it's really great when you have those partnerships. I think like Marika, we're looking um, at how we're funding and, and you know, we've been so focused on the last 10 years on outcomes and um, we are really trying to think more about um, an equitable recovery because um, our, this sector, um, our childcare systems and our, um, have, were, they were stressed before COVID. And um, we've really been um, band-aiding it together over the last hundred and some days um, during this experience, but it's really elevated um, to us locally um, how weak um, our sector is and how many um, problems we have um, in, our, in our sector. So, um, you know, I'm excited to just to talk more about that and what does it look like um, after we um, what our new equitable recovery looks like for us in our community. And Anne, what would you add? Well, this has been great. I, I, I couldn't agree more with, with the comments about the, the key for, for partnership is really about investing in the national local relationships because it's, it's so important for the national level act, actors to really build relationships with us so that they can have up-to-date information about what's going on in our locations and tailor their initiatives to to the reality of what's happening on the ground, what our assets are, where we have important innovations already in place, and where the partnerships can be most productive. And so when I think about the opportunities, I think about three kinds of opportunities for investment. One is where, where we at the local level have really been doing a lot of innovation and um, have learned a lot and have been building infrastructure that is really I like to think about it as the investable infrastructure in some of the work that we've been developing over time. And so in Oregon, we, for example, have a, a model of relief nurseries that was really just started in Oregon, but it could have, um, it could have relevance across the, the country. Or we have been working for 20 years to develop um, an infrastructure for universal parenting education that is just ripe for additional investment. And sometimes, um, the national funders may not be, uh, it, you know, we want them to help us sort of scale up. And so it's, and that's, and when we have something as rich as those kinds of things or the work that we've been doing around P3 alignment or child sexual abuse prevention, that's, I think there's a lot of innovation and investable infrastructure. So that's one kind of thing. But another is just sort of going back to what Elizabeth was saying. Sometimes there are, there's something new and emerging in a field where we don't, we don't have the opportunity to link to the new knowledge or to the leadership in the field or to the new research. And I'll give you an example of what we've just, a link that we just made because we're interested in infant mental health and early relational health and, we, health and we'd heard about David Willis's work and the work that's going on at the Center for the Study of Social Policy. So now we made a grant to try and make sure that that gets brought, that knowledge gets brought into some of the new work that's happening in Oregon around early relational health. And then the third thing I want to say, I just want to really applaud Janet for talking about momentum building and the need for there to be a, a kind of a collective voice around that and the power of multi-state alliances around for national advocacy. We have a lot of really sophisticated advocates at the state level in Oregon and expanding that voice and taking that for a national sort of for the national alignment, the national kind of so the power of national partnership is really important. Thank you, wonderful comments. And again, I just wanted to point out, you mentioned uh, David Willis and the work around early relational health at CSSP. So 
you're setting these up so well. Thank you so much, Anne. We have a TLR Learning Tuesdays uh, webinar scheduled for July 28th at 3 p.m., which will feature uh, Dr. David Willis and focus on that topic. So for those who are interested in learning a little bit more about that, tune back in in two weeks um, for that session. Um, so we've talked about um, kind of opportunities for collaboration and co-investment and the barriers to that. What about shared learning? You each were kind of mentioning this a little bit, but where do you see the potential for kind of deepening joint learning and shared learning among um, national funders and state and locally facing funders? And for this one, I thought that maybe we could start with you, Elizabeth, again. Wow. Um, you know, I think um, obviously the campaign for grade level reading um, is one way where we can learn about best practices and, and research. And, and um, for many of us who've been part of this for years, um, it really has um, been a movement. And um, that's been exciting to see how you know, we've all grown together in this work. Um, but there are, you know, as Janet pointed out, there are um, a lot of national um, uh, leaders that we also can learn from. So I think. That's why it's great when we have these opportunities to lift up best practices um, from others that are seeing. So um, just being, all of us being open to learning constantly and, and uh, thank you for putting the campaign for putting us together, you know, in these ways. Wonderful, and then to you, Marika, where do you see um, more opportunities for shared and joint learning around this work? I mean, certainly from conversations like the one we're having now, where we can, again, lift some of the lessons learned and highlight some um, scalable initiatives. Um, I think having more opportunities to learn directly from the experts and ensure that our definition of experts include those who have actually studied the issue, as well as those with lived experiences navigating these issues i think is really important it has been significant in our work in dc where we made sure that um we had all of the key stakeholders at the table and included those who had lived experiences um with the issues uh both as a user <laughs> um, of the systems we're trying to shift um as well and, and working within the system as well so this inside out um, role. It was important to have both voices at the table. Um, and I think we've been conditioned to use data and research for accountability and monitoring and not for learning. So I think um, there's a great potential in us just looking at all the reports and research and data we, are, we currently have and sort of retool them so that we can use them for, for learning and improving um, versus only using them for accountability or monitoring. Great points. Um, and what would you have to sh add or share in terms of opportunities for shared learning and joint learning? Well, I'll say ditto to what Elizabeth and Marika said, and uh, maybe just add one point because I, 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 in some ways, the early child development field is a very sophisticated field with a lot of knowledge about what it is that produces outcomes for kids. And so for me, from my perspective on the ground, the issue is not so much what we need to do, but actually the challenge is the implementation challenge. It's actually putting it into place in, a high, in high quality ways because we know quality is really important. So putting it into place in real time, in a real place, with real institutional constraints, with real financial constraints, with a real systems barriers and so on. And so to me, I, the opportunity for, for partnership is really to me around making it real and what we learn about how to make it real on the ground, whether it's some of the state policies that you were talking about, Janet, that you that have been shown to be effective in helping to, to, to create the space for doing the work, but also just overcoming the fragmentation that Marika was talking about and really getting high quality programs into place and sustained over time. And that to me is is the challenge that those of us who are on the ground are facing all the time and where I think there's really an opportunity for joint learning. Yeah, Sarah, if I, I might add, I, I think there, um, there's lots of opportunity for joint learning, but also joint doing, you know, or I don't know, better way to say it, but joint impact. And 
I think if you listen to what all the panelists have said, you can see a variety of ways that local and national funders and partners can play together from the points that Anne and Rika and Elizabeth and others made about innovation. I mean, we have a network, you know, of a lot of national partners and a lot of states and communities. So, you know, that's where innovation comes from is the ground, you know, the folks that are actually working, you know, in the communities. And we've got a wonderful network to lift that up with. You know, we have a lot of communities of practice. In fact, the whole purpose is to really see that innovation and to get to create a way for others to learn from each other and to follow examples. You know, um, where national funders can help us to create that network, but also to invest in things that it doesn't make any sense for every community and state to invest in themselves. You know, um, we funded the University of Oregon to do some work on what are measurements that are, other people are using and what's, what are the ones that have been sh shown to be effective and for what. Um, things like the cost of childcare or financing, what are different financing mechanisms that others are using. So you know, a lot of stuff we can invest in centrally, like measurement tools, that there's no point in everyone investing in their own states or communities about, but we can learn as they get applied and then refined. And um, I think national funders are also, um, at least we are very excited about providing resources for collaboration at the state and the community level. We, we're very, very interested in doing that. And I think where we really make progress on the momentum building and learning side is the link between national, state, and local. That's why we invest at all three levels is because if you got something at the national level, but it doesn't go live in the state locally, it's, there's no point. You know, but likewise, as you all know, um, communities need states to do things, but states don't actually do things. It's the communities, right? You know, so those linkages between state and community and then linking policy from, you know, federal, when you go to federal policy, they want to know what's happening in the states and what's, what, what's working. They want to see the examples at the community level. You know, and likewise, the communities need the states and the federal government to do things. So the ability to be able to link local and national, I think, is where we start to see momentum and where we start to see really real learning and we see real impact. Wonderful and important points about the need to do this at the different levels and the need to connect all of those levels if we're really going to um, move the needle and gain traction. And so now um, we've had a number of questions that have been posed for our panelists in the Q&A box. I would encourage those of you who've been listening into this conversation who have not yet posed your questions, I'd invite you to uh, post your questions in the Q&A box. I'll start sharing them with um, our panelists um, during our remaining time together. And um, one question kind of talking about all of the la layers of work that are required and all of the investments and efforts that have been kind of applied in towards supporting children and families during these first three critical years. Um, we had somebody ask, you know, so are we moving the needle on school readiness after, you know, 20 some years of these investments and finding new ways to work together and learning about best practices? Um, do any of you have any thoughts or comments about um, kind of the progress that we are seeing as a result of these efforts? Just jump in. I would just say whatever progress we've made isn't anywhere close to near enough. <laughs> yeah, so I think we, you know, um, we're, we're spending a fair bit of time with a number of other foundations and uh, the World Health Organization with the GSED and the National um, and um, HRSA on the measure of healthy and ready to learn to be able to create a population level measure of um, children's development that will kind of sink nationally. So we don't right now have um, a measure that's had a population level of development for children under the age of three. <clears throat> but I think, I don't think there's anyone on the call that wouldn't agree that as much progress as we may or may not have made, we're just nowhere close to the level of progress that we need to make. And I will just jump in to say that I think that it's that th this is where we see a lot of inequities in the system. Um, kids who are, you know, I mean, we see the, the kids who come from wealthy communities, wealthy households have so many more advantages and we can see the differences 
in their kindergarten readiness when, when all of the resources that their families and their communities and their, their high quality learning systems have um, all been coordinated for them so that they enter kindergarten ready to learn. But for those of us who are focusing on poor kids, kids in rural areas, kids of color, and so on, um, that's where we have really a lot of work to do. So it's, um, that, that's one of the, the things that I'm sure that I know that all of us are working on. I mean, I think that's a loaded question. I think first we have to unpack what kindergarten readiness really means. Um, <laughs> um, but I do think we've definitely been making some progress um, with the building the momentum and awareness. Um, I think like um, everyone just stated that when it comes to equitable access and quality is where we continue to fall short. But I, I think we're continue to build the momentum and public awareness. The only thing I would add is that we finally in Iowa got a um, standardized um, across state um, measurement. And I know that seems like um, not a big deal, but it is one way for us to measure um, across the state where kids are when they enter kindergarten. So small win, but an important one for us. Yeah, definitely an important win. We won't know if we're moving the needle if we don't know how to measure the needle. Um, several of you were kind of um, setting us up for the next uh, question. Michelle Roan Cooper was asking how you are addressing racial inequities. You were, in the last response, in your response to the last question, you were talking about how we're being effective with, with certain groups. Uh, certain groups are being supported, but many are not. So um, can you share what you're doing to, to address the racial inequities in terms of supports for children and families during these uh, first three critical years? Um, sir, for us, every single um, state and community has a plan on how they address it. So as you can imagine with the different states we have, the, you know, um, there's a lot of differences between states. There are also a lot of differences on the level of, of effectiveness that the states have um, in terms of even knowing the data on inequity. So with each of our states, we work with them to break down the data of um, delivery of services and who the services go to, as well as where their infants and toddlers are and, and where their infants and toddlers are in terms of poverty level. Um, and then in each of their strategies, they begin to focus on what populations and what locations they want to address and how they want to address them. I think we've got um, a really, really long way to go in terms of measuring the effectiveness of programs. It's one of the things the Harvard Center for the Developing Child and others are doing. While we may know overall a program's effective, we really don't know who it's effective for. And then I would say even at the level of policy, our Policy Impact Center, when you try to say in that research about policy, does any of that research talk about the effectiveness of that policy within populations? and very, very little research does. So for us, it's really about starting to ask the questions and in our grant making and our partnerships, trying to provide tools around data, around understanding the effectiveness of programs and policies, um, and also about creating um, coalitions and leaderships to support different populations being involved in different ways. And I think for us, we're certainly strengthening our racial equity muscle as a foundation. And we're just, we're asking ourselves critical questions and using the responses of those questions to impact um, our work. Um, we're asking questions like, first of all, what are we supporting? Um, who are we supporting? And what is their proximity to the communities we want to serve? How we fund um, and who benefits uh, most from the supports and resources we're providing. So by asking ourselves all of those reflective questions, as well as continuing to strengthen our own um, racial equity muscle, we're deepening our commitment to diversity and equity. Yeah, I would agree with both these, um, what both of these women said. Um, one thing that I would just highlight that's been effective for us is 
in our home visit space, we are now um, providing services in 40 different languages and dialects. And that has just been so um, important to build those relationships with those families. And although it's, it's hard to do, um, it just makes up a huge difference. And the other thing we're finding in our research and our work is we have universal preschool here in Iowa, but it's half day. So it really only works for what Ann was describing, um, families that have the ability to pick up their kids at 11, take them to the next situation or take them home. And so um, our data really shows us that kids that don't have that um, preschool experience start kindergarten behind. And so trying to figure out ways that um, through funding and partnerships with our schools to figure out how do you overlap and have an all day experience for, for these kids that most need it before they enter kindergarten. Did you have something you'd like to share to that, Anne? Yeah, I guess um, I would just, I, I agree with everything. The only, I would just add that in, in rural Oregon where we are, we have the, the fastest growing population is Latino and we have a huge Latino farm worker uh, population that's, that's really, our fastest growing population, I keep talking about it as the Latino revitalization of rural Oregon, which is a, which is a great thing, but none, of the, but none of the systems are set up to serve the Latino population, whether they are either migrant or, or they are um, permanent residents. And this is something that we've really tried very hard to, to expand our capacity to be able to, to meet their needs. Um, you know, in rural areas, it's just an, it's just yet another inequity, and that's where we're trying to think about geographic inequities as well, too. Thank you. So I'm going to interrupt the questions for just one moment. At the beginning of the webinar, I shared that I'm just going to be posting a brief survey poll. I just did that, so I would encourage you um, to take a moment to share your thoughts and feedback on that while we'll continue the Q&A with our panelists. Um, as well. So building on this previous question, um, Isabel Geffner um, pointed out that COVID is going to um, really just increase a lot of the disparities that we were just talking about. So do you have any thoughts um, or ideas about how we could build the system back better, possibly, so that it's um, addresses these inequities that are being exacerbated right now, but also helps to create a system that uh, addresses them after the COVID crisis. Um, can I, I'll just jump in really quickly because I, I, the thing that is really on our mind is childcare and basically the collapse of the childcare system. And, um, you know, childcare, as we all know, was was had a pretty weak economic model to begin with. And so, um, you know, we've seen even in this COVID period that when, when some of the businesses were seeking loans, banks didn't want to lend to childcare businesses because they're high risk, low margin businesses. And so the question that I think is really worth asking right now is whether there's an opportunity to really rethink the, our system of childcare. We know it's broken. We know how important it is for our kids. We know how important it is for the workers and start to think about innovative, use this moment as a way to just shake up the system and think about innovative ways of doing it, whether it's anything from shared services to, to um, innovative financing models, to micro centers that can be anywhere in offices and hospitals and all that empty commercial space that isn't gonna be used now for a long time. Um, it could be perfect for childcare centers. In-home care that Janet was talking about, I think this is a, this may be a moment because we can't recover economically without a better, without a better childcare model. We know our model was broken. So I hope my, I'm optimistic that maybe this is a moment when we can really rethink that. Yeah, I, I, I a thousand percent agree with Ann. <laughs> you know, we've really been focused on not rebuilding the same crappy systems that we had to begin with and really trying to use the resources that are going to be coming and have come to build back better. Um, you know, and we totally agree with you on um, family child care um, and networks. And what we have seen is where there are networks, um, there's been 
a much better support available for um, family child care. Um, if you go to that homegrown site, Natalie has done a bucket load of thinking on how to build back better. And we know there's a lot of local and federal interest in supporting networks to support family child care. I think it's across the board. We've got a big group that's looking at how to build back better, you know, where they're seeing states and communities use resources to build back. Um, with our fingers crossed, I think there's a pretty reasonable chance we're going to see some significant money flow from the federal level into child care. I think our hope is that they'll leave um, enough room for states to be able to make um, choices themselves on how to use that money. And we've been trying to partner with states to think about how to take that money and use it to build infrastructure that will allow them to be able to build back better. And I know someone's mentioned in the chat box home visiting, there's a whole consortium on the home visiting side that's trying to learn from telehealth and what are the things like in rural communities and others where telehealth actually might be something, you know, that we see as a way to be able to partner with other things to build back better. So I think, you know, the more we can do right now to say, we're already spending money in different ways. How do we know what's working that we can take and use and apply as we start to emerge and go forward from here? But I think that's absolutely critical to ask right now. Where is the money? Where can we put the money that builds infrastructure that allows us to build that better? And I'll add that this is an opportunity for some collaborative work. Um, I think that we can definitely create co collaborative frameworks that can be localized and contextualized. I think this is a really great opportunity um, for national, state, local advocates, as well as federal, state, local funders to collaborate, align, and create some unifying collaborative framework. Um, I think the challenge with doing that is again, going back to sort of just our inherent fragmentation that sometimes what keeps me up at night is that we're going to end up having 50 plus build back better models that are all pretty much saying the same things. And so um, I think there's a, a brilliant opportunity for us to um, resist the urge to um, further fragment and work together to build back better with a more aligned framework. Uh, great point, great point. A um, couple of questions for you, Janet. Uh, one that's going to be a really quick one. Uh, April Javis was wondering who is the California lead? Um, she's obviously based in California and interested in connecting. And then also, um, so the breadth, depth, and thoughtfulness of your work is very impressive, says Elizabeth Lynn. She's wondering um, what's going to happen after 2023. You talked about this ambitious goal moving towards 2023. What happens in 2024? Yes. All right. So in California is the California Children and Family Foundation, which is really the first five. The first five and the first five association is our lead in California, in particular, um, Sarah Crow. Um, and I'm, and if I put Jerry's name, um, Jerry Cobb on the last slide, but if there's any other state or community that wants to know how to find the leads within the states, um, Jerry can be the one to make the connect there. Um, 2023 was just a point in time to be able to plan towards. They actually are creating plans for both 2023 and 2025, 25% increase in services by 2023 and 50% by 2025. So it obviously goes beyond that, but that was just a planning point, you know, to be able to set a goal at a particular point in time. Um, we, you know, I'm sure we will never leave this space <laughs> as long as, and JB's a pretty young guy, you know, as long as um, um, he's alive and kicking and we're alive and kicking. Um, so I think we'll keep, you know, I don't know I, if we'll add more states or how we'll kind of evolve um, from there, but the idea is to take the learnings from the 20 states and to apply it to more states, and that's why NCIT and BUILD is set up that way, too. Okay, one more quick question for you in terms of uh, Marlene Spalton was asking or, or saying that community foundations seem to be natural potential partners in this work. Have you worked with community foundations? Lots and lots. Community foundations, I think, are um, at least the majority of, of the leads with our community initiatives, our community. We have also worked within communities and we just did a community innovation grant. Each of the states was required to make links into communities. So a lot of the state, all of the state plans have links with various communities within their states. 
And in many cases, those are with community foundations in those states, as well as like the mayor or the governor, I mean, the mayor of those particular or county commissioner of those particular communities. So I know we're about to end our time together. I just wanted to share and see if there's any quick comments for two questions, one shared by Dawn Kraft in terms of asking how you connect with school districts and communicate the data to appropriate systems partners. And then Alexis Bivens um, was saying that she heard mention of early screening and wondering how, um, in speaking to your point, Marika, that a lot of times systems are fragmented and efforts are fragmented. She's worried that screen, if screening is fragmented and not laddered up, it remains hard for communities to understand what, how, and when to screen. So anybody have some quick comments on those two questions, or we could follow up and share your comments in the follow-up email if that makes more sense. Uh, what are the recommendations that's going to come from the Policy Impact Center is a, some of the best practice policy based on research is around screening. Um, they're totally right where it falls apart is on the implementation of the screening. And so there'll be some guidance there on states and communities that have done a particularly good job and what some of the watch outs for are in terms of screening. All right, well, we have now gotten up to the end of our 90 minutes together. So I want to say thank you so much to our panelists, to Janet Fresher, to Elizabeth Buck, to Marika Cox Mitchell, and to Ann Kubish. Thank you so much for trying out this new funder to funder conversation approach with us and sharing so much wonderful information with us today. Just wanted to share quickly um, that this new funder to funder conversation is a mini series we've got going on this month. So you can see the other three, com the other two conversations scheduled for later on in July. And then wanted to remind you to take advantage of more learning opportunities throughout the week. If we could go to the next slide. GLR week is just kicking off right now, but there are more opportunities throughout the week um, for uh, shared learning. I uh, hope you can take advantage of those. There was a link in the, you could go to the Campaign for Grade Level Reading website to figure out how to register and learn more about each of these sessions. And then of course, so many wonderful learning opportunities in states and communities across the country. We've heard so much about how important the work on the local level on the ground is in today's conversation. So um, just a reminder to check out the website and learn how you can register for those um, state and local conversations as well. Thank you to everyone who joined in for the conversation today. Um, I hope you found it helpful and useful, and then I hope you'll tune in later on this afternoon for our GLR Learning Tuesday session with um, Mississippi, hearing from the governor and the state uh, education superintendent about the work going on there, and um, hope to see you for future uh, Funder to Funder conversations as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>